welcome to the Antiquarto, an online series of conversations hosted by American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealog Genealogical Society on behalf of almost 400,000 members and millions of online users. Uh, we hope that you will take advantage of our resources at AmericanAncestors.org. If you're not already a member, uh, we hope you will join or at least register for free and take advantage of many of the online programs that we have. I'm Brenton Simons, and I'm delighted to bring you a very special program today. And just by way of background, we recently had an online program with a good friend, Anthony Amore, who is the lead detective in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist, and now the author of three books on famous art thefts. And uh, the topic of art theft is, of course, one very interested, interesting to historians and genealogists because we fancy ourselves as detectives and we love the work of piecing together mysteries and solving crimes and puzzles. And so I was very excited when Alex Foley contact, contacted me and told me about this new book, Lost Art by Anya Shortland, uh, which is a the first casebook volume uh, from the Art Loss Register. And so I was very excited when we were able to arrange a visit by the founder and chairman of the Art Loss Register. And so today, Julian Radcliffe is joining us from London. Thank you so much, Julian, for being with us. And why don't we jump right in? What is the Art Loss Register? It is the largest searchable and international database of stolen, looted, missing, and fake art. And its purpose is to prevent those items getting into the reputable market and to protect collectors and buyers and valuers and insurers. How did this register come about? Uh, I can claim no credit for the idea in that Sotheby's approached me when I was running uh, another company which is called Control Risks and which undertook kidnap negotiations and other anti-kidnap work for Lloyds of London and other many mil multi multinational companies and families. And they approached me because they realized that they needed somebody who was used to working with the police, with insurers, and with uh, clients, because getting back art in some cases is similar to the negotiations with criminals that have to be carried out in kidnap and hostage situations. So they came to me and said, we need a database of stolen art and we need to find a way to prevent it being sold by the criminals in order to reduce its attractiveness. Well, first of all, that's a fascinating background, and I, I would love to know more about what you did uh, in, in your role prior to the Art Loss Register, so, so, so please tell us more about that. But I also want to ask really how prevalent this uh, thefts and forgeries are today, but, but first, why don't you say a little bit more about what you've done in, in terms of negotiating and dealing sure. with criminal elements? Uh, the, the origin of this was that I was sent uh, by the Foreign Office in 1970 to write, I think, the first paper on the Palestinian terrorist movement. And when I was in Beirut studying them, I realized that they had decided to switch their attacks from government targets, which were well defended very often, to civilian targets like airlines, oil rigs, cruise ships, and so on, which were not well defended and where they got just as much, if not more publicity. And shortly after that, they started hijacking airlines. And uh, there was a celebrated case where a woman called Leila Khaled was uh, a woman hijacked a jet into the UK and was then let go uh, and sent back to Lebanon. And when I wrote the report, I said, all of these things are insured by Lloyd's. I think we ought to go and tell them that they may be having some problems. And the Foreign Office said, OK, off you go and tell them. And when I went to Lloyd's to tell them, they said, you stay here and do something about it. 
and that's how I was dragged into the insurance business. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. There's a sort of James Bond aspect to all of that. Um, how so? You obviously have a, an important service and an important register, but how prevalent is this uh, business of theft and forgery and art napping, which was a new term to me? What's going on? And and in, in the book, you say a little bit about what's happened in the last decades in the art market. What is going on? Well, the the problem of art theft has declined partly because of higher standards of due diligence by auction houses, dealers and collectors and museums. So that 30 or 40 years ago, nobody worried about the provenance of previous ownership of an item unless it helped confirm its authenticity. So if the provenance proved that it came out of Picasso's studio and was given to my grandfather and then I got it later, then that was of interest. But the general run of the mill ownership story was not of interest unless it happened to include, uh, you know, a czar of Russia or somebody like that. And the result of that was that nobody asked any questions about who was selling because there was confidentiality about the names of sellers and buyers in the art market, some of which is justified but must, much of which I'm afraid has been driven by tax reduction and tax planning. So the last 40 years have seen a greater effort by the art trade to prevent themselves being drawn into stolen money laundering and other problems. And I think we can claim a fair share of the credit for that. But of course, we can only work as well as the art trade uses us. And we now have over 150 auction houses who check everything they buy and sell. And the same is true for mes many of the top art trades, museums, and so on. And that has driven down theft from private houses and to a degree from museums. But today, for example, I was talking to the police in Holland who've had 15 significant thefts from museums this year already. And that is because there is a gang which has found that art is not very well protected. They're stealing it, but may not have worked out what they're gonna do with it. Hmm. But the other really big problem in the art trade, bigger than theft, is the problem of fakes and forgeries. We can record fakes, but it's a huge problem. And sometimes, of course, a matter of opinion between experts, connoisseurs, as to whether this picture is by Sir Joshua Reynolds or not. Well, that's a perfect lead in to one of the cases that is written about in Anya Shortland's book involving a Turner seascape. And one of the things I thought a very insightful um, phrase she used was at first sight, the system looks like it is based on three equal pillars, science, art, historical and connoisseurly expertise and provenance. But in some cases, provenance is key. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about that Turner case and the general issue of attributions? Sure. This was a fascinating case because only provenance proved that it was a fake. What happened was there was a, a, a rascal, a criminal with a criminal record who found an old picture of the right period when Turner was active and he said that this was the missing picture which Turner was believed to have painted of the arrival of a member of the royal family by sea in the UK. And he was known to be at the port when this occurred. So it was perfectly possible that he took notes at the time and then painted in his studio this picture which had never been seen 
uh, or displayed. And he took this picture to one of the great auction houses, to Sotheby's, and they thought that it was a Turner. And it might be. I mean, it, you know, there's a one in a million chance that it is a Turner. <laughs> but they said, yes, it is a Turner. It's worth three or four or five million, maybe more. And that letter enabled this criminal, and everybody knew he was a criminal, but that doesn't stop criminals, of course, sometimes finding very valuable paintings. He then went off to a very upmarket pawnbroker and borrowed a million pounds on the basis of the value that he would get when it was sold. And when he borrowed, or just before he borrowed that money, the pawnbroker came to us and said, will you please check this out? And I checked the provenance which this man, this criminal had given and proved that this picture was not in the sale that he said it was, which was a house sale conducted by a very small auction house in the middle of Wales uh, in the 1950s. I got hold of the catalog from the lawyer who'd acted for the family which had sold the items there. It was not in that catalog. Furthermore, I proved that the individual he said he bought it from, who was supposed to have bought it at that sale, did not exist. So I then went to the pawnbroker and to Sotheby's and I said, I am in no way qualified to say whether this canvas is or is not by Turner, but I can tell you that the man with a criminal record who's brought it to you is lying about the provenance. And therefore I would be very suspicious about the authenticity. And the result of that was that the chief executive who had lent the million despite my letter before he'd actually lent the money, advising him not to, was dismissed. And there's been a court case by the investors in the pawnbroker against the management for having lost the million pounds. Fortunately, Sotheby's were able to retract their valuation and their letter. And the picture, which is probably only worth a thousand dollars on a good day, is sitting awaiting the result of the dispute between the uh, uh, the shareholders and the management of the pawnbroker. Uh, but that was a convincing case of provenance really trumping professional opinions on authenticity. And you know, one of the other things that that case brings up, which I think is so interesting, are all the ways that a painting might simply be by a pupil of the artist or a copyist or someone aspiring to be an amateur, not even a real artist. Um, so there's there are many ways in which a painting may look like a Turner or by some other artist. Can you say something about that? Because I think that has led to a lot of misidentifications and false claims yeah, over the years. Absolutely. And the position has become in some ways complicated by the use of scientific analysis. So, uh, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, there was a famous case in America where the judge said to the expert who was giving an opinion on whether a picture was by Goya or not, he said, um, well, Mr. X, why is this picture by Goya? And Mr. X said, because I say it is. <laughs> and the judge said, we don't think that's good enough because <laughs> other people may not agree. And that has, of course, led to a great deal of work now examining canvases, stretchers, labels, paint, uh, and everything in the picture to check, A, that the materials were available at the time claimed that the artist painted it. And secondly, although that does not prove that the item is by the artist, there are certain other scientific things like, well, semi-scientific things like finding a thumbprint, which is a famous case where if you find the thumbprint of the artist, if it was, of course, in his studio, it doesn't mean that he painted it. It may have been painted by an assistant, 
but the thumbprint is in a way indicative of an interest in the picture. So all these things are not necessarily conclusive. They're all part of a jigsaw puzzle to work out whether it is likely that this picture was by Rembrandt or whoever. And of course, scholarship changes, both because we find another picture that looks even more as though it's the original, or we get scientific information which may cast doubt on a previous opinion. So the whole scientific thing has become important. And one of the things we're looking at now is listing approved laboratories, because there are many laboratories who aren't really geared up to do some of this work, who are offering uh, cheaply confirmation to people who want a certain answer. Well, I'm glad you brought up the uh, the matter of fingerprints, and that also occurred in the same Turner case we were talking about. And the, uh, I believe in that case that 16 points are required and the, the fingerprint on the Turner, uh, so-called Turner painting only had 10. And, um, and that was something I'd really never thought of, which is that this kind of detective work now involves fingerprints too. And I wondered how often is how often does that occur in um, in identifying a work of art? Well, the we begin to use the word fingerprints now generically for what I would call scientific evidence. So let okay. me give you a classic example. The other day, there was a very a very valuable commode chest of drawers stolen from a house which we found 20 or 30 years later in an auction house. And the auction house and the person who consigned it to the auction argued that it was not the same commode that was stolen out of the house, although we were certain it was because it was it had all the marquetry and so on. And so one of the things that I threatened to do, we didn't have to do eventually, was I took dust of the location where it had been in the house. Fortunately, the house had not been that well cleaned or over <laughs> done up. They were overdue and then for a dusting. <laughs> said, we will examine the dust underneath the commode even 20 years later, and we may well find a match. And when we threatened to do that, they took us as being so serious that they gave up their argument. I think that was one of the one of the crunching points. Well, that's fascinating. I would love to turn for a moment to one of my favorite cases in the book, which involves uh, not the Isabella Stewart Gardner heist, which is of course famous here in Massachusetts, but an earlier robbery in 1978 uh, that involved a Cezanne and a cluster of uh, lesser artworks at the same time. And it really is a, it's a protracted case over decades. Can, can you tell our viewers about that one? Uh, yes, certainly. And of course it's close to home since the theft occurred, um, you know, 150 miles north of Boston from um, a Mr. Backwin who ran the hotel at your opera center uh, up at, uh, I think it's Tanglewood, isn't it? Yeah. And he had in his house uh, a number of pictures, including a very good Cezanne, which Picasso said was the foundation of the Cubist movement. Uh, it is a, uh, a still life of a pitcher and apples and so on, on a white tablecloth. And this and a number of other pictures were stolen uh, over a Labor Day holiday. And Mr. Backwin, who sadly died about a year ago uh, and who lived recently in upstate New York, he did all the right things. He hired a lawyer, put out a reward, hired a private detective, and they were unable to find the pictures, even though the man who stole them was uh, strongly suspected by the police a grand jury, though, said there wasn't enough evidence to try him. And that individual who did steal the pictures was then shot by another criminal over a gambling debt. 
and the case really died out. And nobody knew where the pictures were. And 20 years later, an individual in Estonia is asked by a man in Estonia to take photographs of these pictures to London and to see if he could sell these pictures. And that individual who was nothing to do with the art world, he was actually uh, a quantity surveyor in the building trade, he brought the photographs to London and asked a dealer, and the dealer just said, I'm not interested unless you bring the pictures to London for me to see, and you'll need to insure them. And he therefore went to an insurance broker, and the insurance broker contacted me and said, this looks a bit suspicious. And we were quite excited because the fact that he had all the photographs indicated that the collection was still all together. So I said to this individual from the building world, who is giving you instructions? And he said, a man with a mid-Atlantic accent, accent who calls me on my telephone, but I don't know who he is. All I know is that the man in Estonia merely said, you will get a call from this man on your telephone. So I said, well, tell the man on the telephone to appoint a lawyer to negotiate with me. And they appointed a Swiss lawyer. I went to Switzerland and I said to the lawyer, these pictures were stolen, you must surrender them. And the lawyer said, no, they were obtained in a normal commercial transaction. And I said, well, you must tell me who has them, exactly how he got them, and I want them authenticated by Sotheby's so that we're not given a load of fakes. And we argued for months and he wouldn't give me any information. And then he let slip a crucial piece of information. He said to me one day, your client, Mr. Backwin, doesn't deserve to get back these pictures because they left the key by the frog by the back door. Ooh. And the only person who really knew that were members of the family and obviously the thief. So we challenged the lawyer and said, this proves that you're working closely with the thief or somebody connected with the thief. And I then got the public prosecutor in Switzerland to march the lawyer in and tell him that he was close to being involved in a further crime of extortion. And that I think showed them that we weren't prepared to pay, we were going to fight this. And I then agreed with the FBI who were still interested in the case and the Swiss police, that we would give them, apparently give them, the other pictures if they surrendered to Cezanne because the other pictures were worth much less. And they eventually agreed this, we got the Cezanne, and I then told them immediately that the agreement on the other pictures was null and void because it had been entered into under duress. They said, no, not at all. You're used to dealing with kidnappers. You were sitting having a cup of coffee. There was no duress. This was a commercial transaction and you signed them away. And I said, don't try and sell them. We'll, we want them back but they wouldn't do a deal. But five years later, when they thought they had more protection from the Swiss courts, because five years gives them a certain, uh, a certain chance of proving ownership, they brought the pictures to Sotheby's. Sotheby's called me and said, can we sell these pictures? And I thought very quickly, and I thought, if I tell them the answer is no, you can't sell them, then the pictures will not come into Sotheby's because they only had the photographs. So I rang up my board and I said, I want to lie to our biggest client and one of our shareholders. I want to tell Sotheby's that they can sell the pictures in order to get them into the jurisdiction so we can seize them. And then we'll tell Sotheby's that we protected their position because if I told them they can't sell them and they told the consigner, don't bring them, they would then have been involved in a thing called interfering with the title of the pictures, conversion it's called, and they might have been embarrassed by that, to put it mildly. 
So we lied to Sotheby's. All the lawyers always look aghast that I've admitted <laughs> to that, that I've said that that's the real world. And we got the pictures into the jurisdiction and seized them. And Sotheby's didn't say, what are you up to? They understood what was happening. We then went to the High Court in England. We said these pictures were only handed over under duress. And the High Court agreed with us. And we were able to get the pictures from Mr. Backwin. And during that, we worked out, because I'd said when I got the Cezanne, that the person who was doing a deal with us, their identity had to be lodged with an independent lawyer so a court could open an envelope to find out who he was in case it was a terrorist or a man with a real criminal record. And when we opened the envelope on the instructions of the High Court in England, it turned out to be the lawyer for the original thief. And that lawyer, Mardi Rosian, had been given the pictures by the thief as a fee to defend the thief on a gun charge. He had then kept the pictures for 20 years, taken them to France and Switzerland, and then tried to work out how to sell them. And what he'd done was he'd met in the dentist's waiting room, you won't believe this, a Ukrainian who he didn't know, but who had criminal connections. And he said to the Ukrainian, find a way to get these pictures offered to a dealer with plenty of cutouts so that nobody can trace it back to me. Interestingly, that lawyer, Mardi Rose and the Crook, had offered them to a dealer in Monte Carlo who had said, I'm not touching these, I think they're suspicious. But he sadly, he hadn't checked with us, he just was suspicious. So that was the evidence which allowed the FBI to arrest Mardi Rosian. And I was the only witness, bar one FBI guy who gave a short account of the theft. I was the only witness really, which gave the sentence of seven years in jail to Mardi Rosian. And we then went against him and took his house off him and his bank balance and everything else to repay all the legal costs that Mr. Backwin had had. He'd been practicing in Massachusetts, I take it, at the time of the theft. Yes, yeah. he had got in with the medium-sized drug dealers mm -hmm. and he'd been making money defending them. And then he got in with a very unsavory crowd of Armenians of his own background, started living a rather luxurious life with them and I think went off the rails. Well, speaking of Massachusetts cases, and I referenced this earlier, uh, do you, have you been involved or do you have any opinions on the our Isabel Stewart Gardner museum heist? Like all other thefts, we have recorded the items and we undertake half a million searches a year of things going through big and small sales. And we look out for these items because of course, these stolen items are sometimes offered not as they really are, but they're offered with a disguise, i.e. they're offered as a copy, school of, or nobody knows what it is, we want to get a few thousand pounds. So we're looking for them, but we have not found them. And I have to admit that the proportion of stolen art that we recover is a tiny fraction of what we're looking for. So if you take a hundred high value pictures stolen 50 years ago, only about 15 or 20% of them will have been recovered 50 years later. You then have to ask yourself, and we now know what has happened to the others. I mean, I've just come back from Serbia negotiating to get back a stolen picture and that picture has been somewhat damaged. And I've convinced them, I think, that the value of it has therefore been significantly reduced. And you can see that in certain cases, they think, oh, well, we'll just abandon it. So we know that many of these high value pictures are hidden. The person who hides them then dies or whatever, and they're lost, or they get destroyed because they're too hot to hold. And I think we have to accept the fact that there are going to be many pictures that we will never get back. I hope I'm wrong, but we have to accept the fact they may have been destroyed or hidden or lost. 
Well, one of the other cases that I think is so interesting that you were centrally involved in, uh, and this opens up another category of conversation, is the um, Nazi theft, uh, thefts from Jewish families uh, during World War II. And you have a case of a uh, Picasso, Femme en Blanc, uh, and it really involves several localities in the United States, and uh, and I guess the story starts in Paris, but um, can you tell our viewers about that case? Sure. Uh, this is in many ways typical of what has happened to Nazi looted art, because when the Nazis took the art, in many incidents, the art was not found by the Allied armies in the salt mines or in the collection points that the Nazis had put them in because people had started moving them around, planning for eventually trying to make money out of them when peace came. So many of these pictures were uh, either sold into Switzerland by the Nazis because they didn't like certain types of what they called degenerate art. They tended to like the old masters and early impressionist paintings and many other paintings, which we now consider great art, uh, they did not like and indeed sold them into mainly Switzerland and used some of that money for the war effort. So many of these pictures, including this Picasso, then made their way into the legitimate art market after the Second World War. And as I said at the beginning of this interview, uh, in the 50s and 60s, people did not ask where the picture had been or what the provenance was. So they knew it was a Picasso. It had been uh, you know, listed in catalog resumes of, of Picasso's works. Therefore, it was a Picasso. There was no doubt about authenticity. Nobody worried about who'd had it from 1940 onwards. Uh, if you bought it in an auction, the American law and the law in virtually other, every other country would give you good title because you were a good faith buyer. So huge numbers of good pictures, which have been taken from all sorts of uh, Jewish families and museums and collections, found their way into the States because that was the big buying country. That was true of this picture. It went through some perfectly legitimate sales by the standards of those days. These days, that would not be possible. That art is what we call tainted. Even if you have bought something like that great uh, picture by Picasso, you bought it in the 50s or 60s from somebody who bought it from somebody else, all legitimately, nobody will buy that picture now. So you've got to come to some agreement with the family of the original victims of the looting. And we handle in any one year, probably 50 or 60 cases like that, as well as 150 or 200 other conventional theft cases seeking to negotiate a settlement without large sums of money being spent on the lawyers. And often we're able to do that with both parties because we to a degree owe a duty to both the original victim who's registered the item as stolen with us and to the people in the art market who have handled it up to now. They are the people who've searched with us and we have to go on working with them. So we have a relationship which allows us very often to broker a deal. Well, this is absolutely fascinating and I thank you for all the time. I, I just wanna end with a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, can you say something about what the uh, how the layman might use your services and where do you see your services going in the future? For collectors, if they ever have a theft, they should insist that their insurer and they register the theft with us. And even if something is missing, 
I always say to museum curators and private collectors, if something is missing, don't wait, report it to us immediately because it may go into the market very quickly. And we only charge $15 or something for recording a stolen item. And then only if we play a significant role in its recovery, do we charge a fee as a proportion of its value. And that only after all costs have been deducted. So it's not a risky thing to do to register a loss with us. So that's if in a sad event that somebody has a theft. Secondly, anybody who is buying, even if they're buying items of modest two or three thousand, five thousand dollars, should insist that the seller gives them our certificate. And the collector should not pay for that. That should be paid for by the auction house or the dealer who is offering them the item. So that's the second thing. And thirdly, if there is a very significant and permanent collection of art, which is in trust, and it's therefore not able to be inspected every day by the trustees because it's in the house of a member of the family, then we will record that as art at risk in case a member of the family starts selling it even though it's in trust. And that is a service that we provide for the trustees in order to help them prevent the problem that's just arisen where a French bank has had to pay out $120 million to a trust where they failed to look after the pictures and one member of the family absconded with the pictures. My goodness. I was pleased to see in your book references to genealogy as uh, you, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, Picasso case where you had to have genealogists try to figure out who the uh, family members were, who the descendants were. Uh, so we always are looking for applications of our discipline in, in other fields. And uh, just to end on a more personal note, I'm sure you have knowledge of your own family history. Can you say something about uh, where your family comes from, the Radcliffe's? I, I can. Um, there are two versions. The sort of um, romantic version <laughs> is that we are descended from the illegitimate children of the younger brother of the Earl of Derwentwater, who was the last James Radcliffe, who was the last Jacobite executed on Tar Hill in 1745. I but see. I think the real truth <laughs> is, <laughs> is that we are descended from a man in 1760 or thereabouts who was the Dean of Salisbury Cathedral oh. and might have been illegitimate and therefore destroyed all his personal papers. So oh. sadly, that part of our family, the Radcliffe's, only go back to about 1700. Oh. Uh, but I've been fortunate to inherit a lot of interesting material from from other, other parts of the family, but not necessarily from him. Oh, well, that is interesting. And maybe I am I would encourage you maybe to uh, take a DNA test and see where, where that might lead you in your yes. uh, family history. Well, I want to thank you for all the time. And I do want to um, recommend this book. It is a superb book. Um, and I'm sure you're pleased with it. Uh, I think Anya Shortland did a great job of telling so many, the stories we've covered and so many others. And Julian has very kindly offered our members a discount on the uh, American uh, publication of this book when it is published in, I believe in February, 2022. It is available online right now if you wish to order the UK uh, edition published by Unicorn. And at the end of this interview, we'll have uh, ordering information for you uh, for ordering it either way. But I want to thank you so much, Julian. This has been absolutely fascinating and good luck in all your detective work. And we, we hope to hear from you as you solve more cases. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Goodbye.